Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for that screening of Waking in Oak Creek. Um, I am Dora Muhammad, Engagement Director at Virginia Space Center for Public Policy. And I'm so excited to be joined now for our discussion on the film and his work, Harpreet Mocha with the U.S. Department of Justice. He works in the Community Service, Community Relations Service Division. And his title, I'm going to get this correct. He works with Muslim, Arab, Sikh, South Asian, and Hindu communities. Mm -hmm. A lot, but a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Um, and so I was very, very delighted to participate in the Protecting Houses of Worship webinar that you all conducted uh, last week. Um, so I want to delve into that, delve into some of your work, sort of what it looks like in Virginia, where it takes you. Um, and I said this before the screening, and I do want to do this before the discussion, just in light of today's events in um, Highland Park, do want to acknowledge and send prayers of comfort and peace to the family and the community there. Um, sort of as a context, you know, for our conversation, I had shared with the um, attendees today that I attended college in Chicago. And so immediately when I heard the news, I said to myself, that is a Jewish community. Um, and so I'm very familiar with it. And um, so anyway, my heart is, is just pulling in terms of sort of the backdrop, backdrop for our conversation this evening, um, sadly. But so Harpreet, but the, the documentary was so very inspiring. So I want to talk about that and why it inspired me to actually screen it today, because it does align with some of the work we're doing in Prince William County. So we'll wrap up talking about what we're doing there and sort of what me and you talked about sort of following up what we plan on doing in Princeton County. That's the scope for our discussion. Um, won't keep you all long because it is a holiday. I know some people are off from work. So I want to begin with you, Harpreet, and your specifics in your work in terms of preventing um, and sort of protecting houses of worship. Tell us about your work, sort of what are the priorities, what grounds that work. Um, so that we can get an understanding of how really you can prevent and you know hate crimes. Tell us about it. Well, thank you, Dora. I appreciate it. Again, uh, happy Fourth of July to everybody here. Um, I'm Harpreet Singh Mocha. As Dora said, I serve as the national program on issues dealing with Muslim, Arab, Sikh, South Asians, and Hindu communities. Um, I have been with the department for now over 12 years, Department of Justice, and I serve in a component called the Community Relations Service. We are otherwise known as the peacemakers uh, in the department. We were created by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, that was our enabling legislation that created us to work on issues where there are tensions that arise, community tensions that arise based on discrimination of race, color, and national origin. And then in uh, 2009, with the passage of the Hate Crimes Act, uh, that expanded our jurisdiction to work in the preventative and responsive uh, field to allegations or true hate crimes based on the first three, race, color, national origin, and uh, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, disability, and, and probably one more I'm forgetting. Uh, but it's a big, it's a big area, religion. And so, um, how could I forget? And so uh, I oversee um, the Protecting Places Worship program. And we revamped the program in uh, late 2015, early 2016. And we've been um, working on that throughout the nation, putting these forums on. And uh, Dora, you had mentioned, you attended a, a national forum that we put on. And what we've seen is that since um, actually early on uh, 2015 and what have you, we, see a, we saw an uptick in hate crimes, not only directed at different people, but places of worship. And we had seen based on FBI numbers and what have you, that where they track hate crimes and based on religion, that there were some communities that were always Unfortunately, they are always in the lead, the Jewish community, the Muslim community, the Sikh community, and, and what have you. And um, since then, we've seen, unfortunately, a rise in attacks against all faiths. And so it was just really unfortunate. But what I want to say is that we've developed a program to help empower faith-based communities to take preventive measures or even responsive measures to help take steps 
to start securing places of worship and start to think more strategically. Start the word I like to use is be more situationally aware of things and develop a team at your congregation to help you come together. Now, our objectives in this um, forum are always to learn about the different government resources, uh, tools, programs that are all free that communities can learn about and apply for and take advantage of. We want to promote networking with these folks. We also want to give them kind of like a roadmap how you get to learn these programs and how to learn how to report, how to develop relationships. Our objectives are to educate folks, to promote interfaith folks, to engage, to communicate, increase communication so it's not one-sided, multiple community liaisons. We want to have cooperation and coordination. Um, we want to have cross-cultural training. Uh, and at the end of the day, we want there to, you know, that magic word called trust. We want law enforcement communities to build better trust with the interfaith community by setting up a ministerial alliance, a clergy task force, or an interfaith task force with the chief, the city council, uh, where we can talk about these issues on a regular basis for every quarter or what have you. And we can learn about how we can get um, different uh, resources and different folks to come and help us. So with that, those are our objectives. Now I can get into dig a little deeper. When we <clears throat> do our forum, we always start off with the US Attorney's Office and the FBI and local law enforcement talk about uh, how hate crimes are investigated um, locally, state-wise, and federally. We also have the U.S. Attorney talk about federal hate crimes laws and the district attorney talk about um, laws that are particular to that state or that jurisdiction. And then we have the FBI talk about hate crime percentages. What does hate crime percentages look like in your neighborhood? They collect numbers that are a year behind, but still are, are very good for trends. We talk about trends that community groups have shared with us. And we go from there. And we also have the FBI do uh, sometimes an overview of hate crime symbols to be aware of what to look for and not to paint over them. We also have them provide us an overview of the active shooter program. Now it's an overview. Um, it's not the whole thing, but the whole, uh, the point here is to give you a little glimpse of all these programs and how to develop those relationships. Who do you call after your, uh, your church sign has been vandalized? Do you call the FBI? Do you call 911? I mean, of course you call 911 and then you call the FBI and the US Attorney's Office. Well, we all talk about that. And then we open it up for Q&A. And we have, we wanna encourage that it's a, not a one-sided lecture. It's not Charlie Brown's teacher going, wah, 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 wah. You're, you've taken three hours of your time or uh, if you're doing it virtually an hour and a half, we all understand time's important. And, um, and we want you to engage. And then we have our friends from Homeland Security come and talk about uh, the Protective Security Advisor Program where protective security advisors, there are about three to four, two to three that are assigned to every state that will come out if you invite them. They'll do an assessment of weaknesses at your place of worship. Some of them will even uh, give you a report that you can use then to uh, apply for a FEMA nonprofit security grant. Um, and we bring FEMA here too. And FEMA talks about their nonprofit security grant, about how you can use that grant to uh, install cameras, hire arm, you know, uh, guards, or uh, uh, put better, um, you know, a fence around your premises, or take a bunch of steps to uh, safeguard uh, your place of worship. And what the protective security advisor does is they they give you all this, or they'll even loop in local law enforcement, the FBI. They'll come as a team sometimes, depending on what state you live in, and they give you an assessment of hey. And then you can use that assessment and put that in your investment justification when you write the grant and voila. I mean, it's not as simple as that, but, uh, but then what we do is we bring interfaith community members to share their best practices, how they started this journey. So what we know for a fact that a lot of communities kind of just put us government folks in just this one big category. But at the end of the day, we know that peer to peer learning is is very valuable. So if you're a like similarly situated place of worship, you're more likely to ask your uh, fellow synagogue or your fellow Hindu temple or mosque, hey, did you apply for this grant? Or when did you get those cameras? Or where did you get that fence from? Or how are you been dealing with this issue? 
and they'll be more than likely to help. And we have a round table of experts that, uh, of uh, interfaith folks that sit and talk about those. Hey, who did you talk to in your congregation? Who did you pick from your congregation to be on your security team? How did you create a security plan? Where did you get help from? And then, you know, we also want folks at the end to network. If it's live, we want people to let network. If it's virtual, we, we share folks' resources, their contact information, and we encourage communities to build those relationships. You got to get out of your comfort zone yes. a little bit. Yes. And that's key is that, you know, but, and what we want to say is that we're here to help. We have a lot of free, they're free resources. And it's your tax dollars going to paying for all these programs. I understand it's a little hard to navigate. When I go to the, you know, DHS, but there's so many programs, I get overwhelmed. And, you know, this is my, this is my forte. I love this stuff. You know, I can listen to this stuff and talk about it all day. But for the average person, it's like, Harper, where do I go? I mean, where do I start? Who, how do I write this um, grant? Where do I, do I do a, do I talk to a grant writer? Do they provide technical assistance? How do I get an active shooter training? Uh, can we do tabletop exercises? What we want to do is help you develop a plan so you can take advantage of these resources. You can invite in these individual speakers to uh, your places of worship so you can build relationships and then expand on it. And if you work in a working group, you can help your other fellow uh, interfaith partners do the same. So our key is that we want to share information. We want to empower the faith-based community to act before there's a problem. That's what we want to do. And we want the, we, you know, a lot of us are, we work in silos and we want to make sure that, you know, we help each other. And so, and if we have something that we can do to help others, you know, it'll be a really good, I go to, you know, the local Sikh Gurdwara, I'm a practicing Sikh. We go to our Gurdwara on our street, the way the, the, the street, the, my Gurdwara is out. We have a mosque. We have two Hindu temples. We have an African-American church. And I'm always worried about mm, someone who has bad intentions could one day just kind of go, um, you know, spot to spot and vandalize us. Some of them, some of us, some of the places of worship are very uh, savvy. They have cameras and they have those steel barriers and they have, you know, a nice alarm system and everything else. Other ones, not so much. And so what we want to do is we want to promote our interfaith players to definitely you know, learn how to take those steps, educate yourself, be in those relationships. The good thing is that law enforcement's here to help out. Get to know who your precinct captain is. Get to know your community liaisons. And make sure it's not one person. What usually happens is, uh, and at least in our community, the person who has all the law enforcement contacts is on vacation, and that's when we have a crisis. And that's, you know, and we're all trying to call that person to get the contacts. So, I mean, you want to have multiple liaisons within the law enforcement and within your a community as well. And what we want to encourage is that these steps might be, you know, they might be, uh, they seem like a large task, but they are very practical in nature. And every congregation can find gems. Every congregation has people from the medical background, maybe retired law enforcement, security guards, IT people, I mean, business people. So they all have contacts. We just need to find, use their expertise not use, but share their expertise yes. for the benefit of our uh, places of worship um, to move forward. And I mean, some of these conversations are very tough. How do you screen your Sunday school teachers? What do you do? How do you greet new uh, congregation members? If you're a um, congregation or that, I'll tell you in my faith tradition, when we walk into the prayer room, our whole attention is where the musicians are singing hymns and we are our attention is directed where our holy mm -hmm. scriptures are and we're, our back is to the door. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm even sitting there thinking now that I know all this stuff, I'm always looking at the exits, where they are, you know, <laughs> they're sort of blocking them. And even when I go to like, when, uh, when we used to go out to eat, um, you know, I'm slowly kind of getting back. I'm always thinking where the exits, how are we going to, if something happens, that's unfortunate, but also we've had a couple of medical emergencies where, um, people have been in the congregation and they faint. And so we don't have um, medical help. What do we do until 911 or the ambulance shows up? Do you have a turn kit? Uh, do you know CPR? Does someone in your congregation know that? So we want, have you ever done a fire drill 
you know, our kids do them all the time in school, right? They yeah, do, I remember those. Right, you remember those, right? Mm-hmm. Why haven't we? And some workers still do them too, yeah. But I right, don't right, think right. I've been in a house of worship that they did one. Yeah, and so maybe that might be what, you know, if you have an active shooter training at your place of worship, they'll run them through, you know, all of where are you going to run, fight, hide, where are the possibilities? I mean, at places of worship, we're always trying to move things and sometimes our exits are blocked and the mm. piano's there or something else is there, paperwork and everything else. That We want to be, you know, a little more causing, uh, aware of, you know, how do we exit the building? Because at the place of worship, your mom, your folks are there, your kids are there, the elderly, your family, your friends. It's a place of peace. But you want to make sure you got to be in my faith, to, you know, God helps those who help themselves. That's my tradition, right? And so um, you know, I just kind of feel that if we empower that with uh, to the other faith traditions, and I think that'll be, and it, they're small steps that every faith tradition can take. But they're take. practical. They're definitely Go. practical. I want to delve into a couple of things you touched on, and we have a couple of questions that people, sure. if you have any other questions to put it in the Q&A. Um, I do see one question already. Um, so one of the things that you talked about, I um, want you to sort of delve in, you, 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 kind of, you hinted at it, you were saying how you're just now starting to get back going out in the field. So take us back to sort of prior the pandemic, because I'm assuming the pandemic kind of really stopped sort of the infield kind of trainings and visits. Um, but what were sort of in Virginia, if you can, sort of what were some of the areas, like actual locations that you may have visited? Um, sort of what were the trends that you saw in Virginia? Um, I know for us, um, we were um, contacted by Virginia's Department of Criminal Justice Services for a grant, which I don't know if it will be available next year. So that's why I was so happy to learn of federal resources to help houses of worship. But it basically was a grant to combat hate crimes. And they had only one county who had applied for it. And so they reached out to us, said, hey, there's this wonderful funding opportunity do mm-hmm. you, any of your members would be interested in it? And so we try to get different regions, different parts of our chapters, um, you know, partnering with their local municipality because it was a municipality grant. Um, sure. And we had a couple of interested, but we only were able to get one fully through com- completely submitted um, where I live. And I was aware of personally some, you know, hate crimes that were against some of the houses of worship that hadn't been reported. So that's a key part, really educating people on how to report the crimes. Um, but even in the past year that we've been working on the grant, there have been incidents in Richmond. Um, we were mm-hmm. told of heavy Islamic phobia in Southwest where interfaith events were canceled due to death threats. Um, we've even had death threats from some of our legislatures around their support for um, communities and sort of white supremacist threats where we had several of our legislators quarantined a couple of years ago. Um, I believe one of the death threats, that one of the men who they gave a death threat to the Speaker of the House, who's uh, the first Jewish Speaker of the House, is, was in prison for it. Um, and so we've had all these things, sort of this climate in different um, regions show up differently. I mean, just, I mean, I can go on about that, but in Prince William County, the ones that I wasn't aware of, like there were school board members who received Confederate flags in their mailboxes because they wanted to name a school after a historic black um, civic le- um, civil, civil rights mm-hmm. leader versus a white firefighter. And so it was like real tense and right. it, you know, white supremacists showed up in that conversation at the school board meeting. So tell us sort of what is your landscape of Virginia so we can kind of see from where you've been, where you have your feet trod in Virginia. I mean, um, majority of the work that I have done has been in Northern Virginia. I mean, we've done um, um, some trainings and outreach in Northern Virginia. And because, uh, uh, and then we've done work in DC and uh, in in the DC um, and Maryland as well. we have now uh, a conciliator who, uh, we have conciliators. Well, we have uh, 10 uh, different offices throughout the country and we have uh, four regional offices. And uh, where Richmond sits, it's uh, actually Virginia, is in region three, which is the mid-Atlantic region, which I used to be the regional director. Um, uh, 
And so we now have a person, uh, Denise Neiser, uh, that's, uh, that's a conciliator in the area and that can be definitely a resource. And uh, I'll um, share, you know, Dora, I'm gonna be sharing our resource with you as well that can help in um, reducing tensions and sharing best practices in issues where there is community tension or where there has been a hate crime that is committed. Now, we also do hate crimes forums. We do hate crimes forums, which are- That was my next question. Yeah, so we do hate crimes forums that are um, that are three hours long in person and that are, uh, again, an hour and a half to two hours virtually. Now, the hate crimes forum is a three panel um, uh, program or information session. The first session is, again, uh, information from the U.S. Attorney, FBI, local police, and the District Attorney talking about uh, federal, local hate, and state um, uh, hate crimes laws. And then there's a Q&A after that. Yes. Uh, then there's a... The, the but second, don't, move on, don't move on from that. To tease people for that, what he, he's talking about, I'm going to follow up because we're going to do a version of that here in Virginia. So go ahead. And then after that, uh, the second one, is the state of hate in that jurisdiction. So we have community folks, community organizations talk about what does hate look like in this area? So is it a large Islamophobia? Is it law anti-Semitic um, uh, hate? It is, is it directed at the Sikh community? Is it directed at the African-American community? Is it directed at uh, Catholics? So that them are, and then we have, um, and then we have the Q and A follow-up. And then we talk about resources. Now we've talked about the law, we've talked about the state of hate. Now, what can we do? Where's help? What can we do? So we have the victims assistance folks there. We have Office of Emergency Management. We sometimes have um, police on there too. We have one or two of the community groups talk about how, if you're fearful of reaching out to the police when you're a victim of a hate, a bias incident or a hate crime, by the way, we also talk about the distinction between the bias incident versus a hate crime. Mm -hmm. We also talk about uh, freedom of speech uh, issues and that kind of uh, uh, and, and macro and micro incidences uh, that can kind of lead to, if you feel that you're being violated and your rights are being violated, you should report. You know, don't think that just because someone is named, if they are repeatedly calling you a, a derogatory term or what have you, we want you to promote what have you. So basically, our hate crimes forum is that with a Q&A after each, um, each panel so we can empower folks. And we did, a, we did uh, many of those prior uh, to COVID-19 and what have you. Uh, and then we did, when COVID started, we rolled on to the virtual Zoom world and, and we've been doing the uh, Protecting Places of Worship Forum and the uh, uh, hate crimes forum on uh, so, uh, social media and what have you, like we did last week, exactly. Yes. Um, and so we are a little, uh, the virtual forum's a little shorter and mm -hmm. a little more abbreviated. Uh, when we're in person, we're a lot more able to uh, engage and have that one-on-one -on -one contact. Mm -hmm. and so the, that's well, we kind talked of the about, so folks know, we talked about the abbreviated version because for the center, which as you can see, we're still largely virtual. We have begun doing some in-person events. Um, so I and Harpreet talked about really um, all of the, a lot of the different subjects and topics that he shared of really developing a series where we would have smaller forms that is focused on one of these in each of the, in the different regions across Virginia that sort of we can do in collaboration with our chapters, some who are new um, and some that are existing. And so we're gonna develop sort of everything that he said sort of what makes sense to do different regions based on what our members have been experiencing. So definitely look for that. Um, the grant that I shared with you all that I mentioned before, one of the reasons why I really love the Waken and Oak Creek documentary, because they, they emphasized a lot. It wasn't definitely scripted, but everyone was mentioning together, together, healing together, holding it together, building community together. And so that's the name of our initiative, Together in Faith. Um, to combat um, hate crimes. And so we had planned, it is planned. Um, I will drop the link in the chat shortly. Um, but if you're watching this um, recording on our YouTube, um, you can find it on the events um, page, the listing 
on on our website to get involved, that tab. Um, so in Prince William County, we're planning on August 12th, which is the anniversary of the Charlottesville attack. Um, we're going to have a symposium, a Together in Faith symposium to culminate our work in partnership with the Prince William County Police Department, which again was one of the emphasis that um, Harpreet had mentioned, really building strong relationships with um, law enforcement. And so we'll delve into that. But that is really what our project really exemplified. And so we'll hear from different law enforcement agencies. Harpreet is going to help confirm some of the federal and state Virginia FBI speakers, but we have clergy leaders, we have elected officials. Um, and so it's really an opportunity, again, just to highlight a lot of the principles and the key elements that Harpreet mentioned. And so as a follow-up to that, then we'll start to do some of these smaller forms. So I will drop the link in the chat um, momentarily for that. In that link, you'll see, because someone put a question about resources, I added two resources that the webinar that uh, I participated in, Protecting Houses of Worship, that was provided by Harpreet's team. There's one resource called Mitigating um, Hate Crimes Against Houses of Worship, and then there's a Hate Crimes Handout with a lot of just the definitions and sort of the graphs. And so, again, it's national, um, but that's why I wanted Harpreet to sort of mention some of the Virginia um, localities. So while I do that, Harpreet, there's a question um, uh -huh. that was put um, the curious, if a shooting at a black church like Mother Emanuel in Charleston gets labeled as anti-Christian because it was a church as well as an anti-black hate crime, or if it only gets categorized as anti-black. Okay, so um, we do not um, litigate, prosecute, or investigate. That would be uh, more of uh, law enforcement's um, um lane if you may so we help uh, community ten uh where there's community tension or allegations or of uh violent hate crimes and what have you that other stuff is our our uh sister components the fbi and local law enforcement or the u.s attorney that handles that those issues and we can direct direct you to them very good and then there was another question in the chat um how do you find out if their area is a hot spot to hate crime? And I believe we talked about that. That's really tracked by FBI. Is it like they have to track the statistics? Yeah, they have statistics that they come out with um, every year on hate crimes. Uh, and they are a year behind. So they just came out. Uh, uh, so, for example, this year, we are, what, uh, 2022. They'll okay. probably come out in the end of October with 2021 hate crimes and they're regional, they're throughout the country. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I mean, uh, you can check, there are other civil rights organizations that are uh, that are out there that you can check that also uh, collect hate crimes data. And so they can share, they, there's a quite a wealth of information. Huh? And I can't remember, I think it might've been the Eastern Division, Michelle, I will, as a follow-up to today is one of the links we'll put in our upcoming roundup. Um, not this week, likely next week, because in researching this, I did come across some 2021 data that was released, and you can kind of look at your county level, but I don't remember what site it was, but it was a government site. Um, so I definitely try to find those links, but the information is out there. Um, I think that is very important. Yeah. Um, any other questions before I um, jump back to Harpreet? I don't see any. Oh, wait, hold on. Okay, that was answered. Okay, great. So one of the things that I wanted you to talk about, which um, again, I loved, um, was really this idea of, of really the relationship building part of your work. Um, because for us at the center, that is a hallmark of our interfaith work. It grounds our work. Um, of course, yes, we look at policies and we'll be looking at policies um, in Virginia, the laws, um, and so, but our program work supports our policy work. And so as part of our racial equity program, the key for me is really establishing communities, sort of that was discussed in the documentary, the idea of building community. It wasn't just that this event happened, thoughts and prayers, and then everyone goes back. The community wow. actually began to institute things that stayed well after the event. Um, in building community. And so that is really sort of the focus, one of the objectives uh, that we have at the center. 
Um, so I wanted you to talk about that a little bit and sort of like, I think there's some faith communities where traditionally um, being isolated was how they protect, they felt they needed to protect themselves, you know? Um, oh yeah. And so, but I think the other, that makes them the other in community. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's the community and then there's, there they are. And so wanted to really talk about, um, yes, we build relationships with the law enforcement, but how have you seen and how does your work work to build the community within the faith communities um, broadly um, as part of the larger community? Well, a number of ways. I think uh, first my, my mentor told me that, you know, during emergency, that's the worst time you want to hand out business cards. Uh, we want to promote <laughs> proactive engagement, whether that be with law enforcement or whether it be with your um, fellow interfaith uh, partner. And so answering, uh, there's several parts to the answer. Number one, uh, when we do the forum, that peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, that interfaith uh, panel that we have, where they're sharing their best practices of how they you know, how they learned about these programs, how they created a security plan, how they created a security team. And we have different faith-based traditions on there, leaders from those talking about, you know, how they work with their communities and also them sharing their best practices of, hey, um, we, are, we learn from each other. And then the second part would be that whenever we organize these uh, programs, whether it be a hate crime forum or a protect and face worship forum, we encourage that there be a working group set up afterwards if there's not already one. We usually have a planning group that comes and works with us to plan the event and what have you, advertise and go from there. But then we encourage that during the program, we, we even announce it that if you would like to work on this, these issues, if you're interested, and you can join this working group and carry the work on and that builds some momentum. Well, we see, don't I, didn't know you, I didn't know that was a part of your work. So that is, again, one of the priority focuses is we have um, trying to establish a racial equity working group in all of our chapters. So some are more fully formed already, but some are new and growing chapters, but that is a priority. We actually have working groups for our Wonderful. Chapters. I mean, that's, a, that's one of our goals. And so if people can, then they can take, uh, you know, then they don't have to, they're not overwhelmed and, hey, who do we mm -hmm. invite and have, I didn't get everything he uh, or he <laughs> or she presented on this issue or topic then we can individually maybe invite the FBI to talk about their programs, their uh, Citizens Academy, or, or how they investigate and how they partner with, um, with, the, with the local police, even though that is kind of covered and that is not kind of, it is covered in our uh, forums, but they can go in a little more detail in depth and talk about some uh, cases that they have done in that area and what have you, in a little more depth than uh, they could in the forum. Um, and I think that really builds momentum because then, you know, based on the issue or topic that you have, then you can definitely uh, um, like dig down a little more and, and uh, really get uh, more information or information that you need to uh, do what you need to do to secure your place of worship. That's wonderful. So before we wrap up, I have a closing thought, but wanted to sort of leave before we leave the audience and have them have their evening wanted to see if you had any closing thoughts um that you wanted to sort of share um again thank you for your time with us tonight thank you for inviting me today i just wanted to say it's i i'm very encouraged that um that you guys are coming together and creating uh this kind of uh, venue to share this information and if I can be of a resource, please let me know. Uh, Dora, you have my information. I can, uh, I'm, you know, uh, fixing to send you some more information and we're going to talk soon as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But whatever I can do as a resource to help out and encourage you uh, and your team and uh, the community members here to take steps in this direction. Great. I don't have all the answers, but I know we can mm -hmm. uh, work together and find them together and find the expert that can help you and your community and but i encourage you please start taking those steps start even thinking about this stuff and and slowly uh you know action will start and or you know if you're already an expert try to help others in, in moving this forward and we have a whole host of programs that i think you've shared already but we'll definitely uh share more of them and if you need anything please let me know if you give assistance and i also again happy fourth of july to everybody thank you thank you so very much and so my, my closing thought, and I appreciate it because 
we love resources here at the center. We love empowering our members with information um, and even the grant opportunity. You know, this wasn't initially a part of our racial equity program, but because of the response and the climate. And so I had, I shared with um, Kim Bobo, our executive director, to let her know how very much this is personal to me um, because I was a victim of a hate crime when I was a teenager, actually in college in Chicago. And so um, having survived that, um, I told her this is very, very personal. And so um, we, she's really given me permission to really integrate it as part of our racial equity working program and sort of in a way that makes sense where I'm not too, gonna to have too much on my plate, but it, it is just that important to me. And so again, in light of today's occurrences in Highland Park, I think the national climate really spotlights how important this is that we truly do come together. In. And so I look forward to working with all of you look forward to working with your team, Harpreet. Um, and again, want to thank everyone for joining us for this very timely and critical discussion. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.